we had time to get that set up. You'd think by now, after a little over a year being here, I'd figure that button out. <laughs> Keeps me on my toes. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Brad, just give me a little bit of lights when you can here. No rush. That's good. I'm going to keep everybody else in the dark today. <laughs> that way the light is brought to you, right? Light brought to you by Living Water. <laughs> At least I didn't say State Farm. So anyhow, oh, nobody. <laughs> wow, it's going to be a rough morning. It's going to be a rough, you know what? I'm going to do this a little bit differently. So. I have too many things today. I did not put it all in one little spot. But do me a favor. I know there's people close to you, so we'll do it this way. Stick your hands out in front of you. And if the rows were closer, right, the people in the front row, or the people in front of you, could get them a little massage. So just pretend there's somebody in front of you. Work out those fingers. Come on. Yeah, don't, don't like drop things on the floor. It'd be like weird, especially if you're holding a child. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Put your arms up. Keep doing it. Come on. This way. This way. This way. I go, wee. All right, put them down. I just wanted to see what I could do. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the sermon. But you're now your body's moving, your blood's flowing a little bit more. I mean, that song at the end, I thought would like, huh. but everybody's like, mm. it's like raining on your soul right now, and I think that needs to change. But the other day, I was leading a tour um, in a hospital for a bunch of little kids, and I overheard a conversation, it was really weird, between this little girl and an x-ray technician. He asked her, have you ever broken a bone? And surprisingly, the girl said, yes. Did it hurt? No. <laughs> the x-ray technician was very befuddled. He was like, it didn't? No. Well, what bone did you break? My sister's arm. Talk about being broken, right? <laughs> but what's interesting is that'll be part of our reality here today. It may not be a bro bone. Because, and I could tell this story. So, my one nephew and my sister were not in a, in a good argument time. They were, in fact, in a very bad time. And my nephew decided to get really rambunctious, should we say, and came at my sister. Well, that didn't go so well for him whenever she snapped his arm. <laughs> well, she had to pin him down because I don't know what happened. He was just like, she had enough. You know, you, you as a parent, do you ever get to that point where you just had just a little too much and you just went, hold it. We ain't going any further. Well, Somehow his arm got twisted, and it, it's, it broke. <laughs> but he's fine now. He got over it. <laughs> it's like hurdles in life. Sometimes you just got to get over them. Do we have to do the arm thing again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we've been in a series called Broken. And it's interesting that we're doing a series about broken in the middle of one of the happiest times of the year, right? Um, last week, I really had to yell at another pastor, and it wasn't one in this church, just to let you know, it was a friend of mine, because he doesn't like Christmas. He goes, in fact, I wish the holiday would go away. Oh, I know, right? He's like, I look back, and I'm like, all right, so if without Christmas, you don't have Easter. Without Easter, we don't have salvation. Without salvation, we'd be either still sacrificing animals or living an ungodly life. I said, okay, yeah, nowhere in the Bible does it say to celebrate Christmas. But 
you said in front of a whole bunch of teenagers who struggle with their own identity in Christ, not that you don't want to celebrate Christmas. And in front of them, I said you were wrong. My kids were there. This is for teenagers. This is a bunch of youth groupers. And this is a lifelong friend. Not lifelong, at least the last eight years, which is a lifetime for me and him. Because sometimes you just connect with somebody. I looked at him. I said, why? Why? And that's a brokenness because the holidays for him have not gone very well. And he explained that. He explained that it's a, the thing we've been talking about, the business of the season, we forget the reason for the season, but the whys of what we got to do. But in the time of brokenness, this is the best season to become closer to Christ. Because if you don't find it here, it's even harder to find it at the salvation at Easter time. That's the way I would explain it. Because if you don't believe the boy was born incarnate, fully God, fully human, by the virgin birth, you miss the whole point of who he is growing up and why he was sacrificed, spotless and blameless. But sometimes we want to talk about being broken Sometimes it's our own fault, right? How many of you have ever broken a bone bone doing something stupid? <laughs> no. <laughs> and if my wife was here, her hand would be up. If you notice, my hand wasn't. I have yet to break a bone. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me from that. Now, she was doing something stupid. Her and her brother said they wanted cookies. Cookie jar was on top of the fridge. My wife got coaxed, you know, coerced into um, moving a chair over to the countertop, climb up on the chair, climb up on the countertop, walk the fine line against the other, you know, you know where I'm going with this, right? Turn, the cookie jar, set it down, get a cookie. Put the cookie jar back so you didn't have any evidence of the cookie jar being out, right? I mean, these kids, my, sister, my wife and my brother-in-law are very smart people. My brother-in-law is smarter than my wife at the time. Um, had the cookies, turned, <laughs> <laughs> broke her arm. My brother-in-law ran away. I don't know what she was doing, he said. <laughs> Interesting stories we have at the holidays. How many of you have interesting stories sitting around the table? Of broken bones or of past things that have been stupid in your life. But sometimes we're broken on our own, by our own accords. Sometimes we are broken by others. I don't know if you know, this year's been kind of rough. And I'm going to get to a little bit more of that in just a minute. But sometimes others are breaking us. Our hearts, by the things they say and the things they do, the knives that are just kind of driven into your, your bones and into your nerves, and it just feels like such agony. Sometimes you are broken, and get this one, so that God can reassemble His creation. Sometimes you are broken so that God can reassemble his creation, which is you, me. And that's where we're at in this series. Today is putting the pieces back together. We heard first week of how the brokenness has come right from the beginning, where everything was perfect and divine until she did it, until the snake made me do it, right? You remember that? Pastor Luke brought a great message, right? Then last week, in our broken pieces that we leave shattered on the ground, need a, a, a reassurance and a putting back. You know, she, Marissa really hit a lot on what this today's message is, but she hit a lot on why we become broken and how the pieces are there and how to be reassured and be fixed. 
And I asked her, I told her last Sunday when she left, I said, thanks, I get to preach this week, you know, next, you know, next week. She goes, oh, you'll be fine. I said, I don't know. God's got to bring a mightier word each and every time. So, oh, man, I got to preach next Saturday, too. I'm going to say, wait, Pastor Andy's got to preach next Sunday. You know, hopefully he can step up his game, but I guess I got to do Saturday first. So, don't forget, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Okay? Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Just remember that. You have three chances to be back here. So anyhow. So in 2017, I thought that was my personal toughest year ever in life. You know, you've had spots in life where you just really just don't like, right? I've named them by years now. <laughs> like it doesn't go well the whole entire year. 2017, personally for me, was the hardest time that I thought. <laughs> 2018 showed up started out very well. And I shared with Pastor Luke and Pastor Andy on Friday night that I wrote something at the end of 2017 that I saw fulfilled. And I didn't remember even writing it. I remember it was whenever uh, Pastor Andy and myself and Marissa and Beth were, we met for a prayer day or prayer hours, I guess. It wasn't a whole day, but this is when I remember writing it. It says, I will fall in obedience to God. I need to bear good fruit. I will watch less and read more. He will make me fall in obedience to him. He will produce in me good fruit by my obedience to him. What's first, those first two are arrows pointed down to the last two. Because I could not do it on my own. And in that prayer time, he reassured me that he's going to make me do it, whether I like it or not. And he has. And he has. So to see something come to fruition over the last year that I had no clue or remembered writing until I really sat down and figured it out. 2017 is a blur to me now compared to what things have gone on in this year. Let me just sum it up if you haven't been around or if you haven't known me. I wrote this. 2018 stomped all over 2017. Ain't kidding. Two car accidents, a bunch of layoffs, four surgeries, food poisoning, one death, just considered it pain and suffering. Yet, I still worship God. Yet, I still worship God. Let me talk to you about something. How many of you are movie f- people? Like, do you guys like to watch movies? Some of you? Some of you, well, I watch less and read more. You know, these are old movies, so t- it wasn't 2017 movie except for one, but we're not going to talk about that one. So, how many of you ever watched The Avengers? Okay. How many of you at least know who The Avengers are? All right. Can you name me one Avenger? Captain America. Come on, give me another one. Thor, next one. Hulk, I heard Iron Man in there. Who else? No, we're, don't even talk about the DC Universe, bud. <laughs> we're, we're Marvel people in my life. <laughs> Black Widow, come on. And Hawkeye. They formed the first Avengers team. They assembled, with along with Nick Fury and um, Agent... I'm drawing a blank because he died. Uh, <laughs> H. And Coulson. So <laughs> I was hoping somebody else would like really speak it up. But. but in the movie, The Avengers, they were all separate people. They got introduced before The Avengers came together. And then they assembled a team because there was such an attack on the United States at the time, you know, the world. And they assembled this team of misfits with the exception of Captain America, because he's the best. So, I have no preference. Just, <laughs> But they assembled together, and their first assignments together, huh, did not go so well, did it? They failed at everything they did. People died. And yet, somehow, some way, they reassembled for a purpose. 
And of course, you know, beat down Loki and, you know, all that stuff like that. The best line in the whole entire movie, Captain America, they're in the Quinjet. And uh, Black Widow says to him, you know, Cap, you might want to sit this one out. Those people are just like gods. There's only one God, ma'am, and he doesn't dress like that. Our God doesn't need a cape. He doesn't need superpowers because he is the superpower. But they were broken before they could really join together. They realized that they had a common purpose, and we have a common purpose. Brokenness is sometimes because of self-infliction. There's things in my life that have crept up over the years that have gotten washed away, but yet they still sting you in the back. They still poke you and just remind you, hey, remember? You remember? Huh? Huh? Sometimes you fall. And I call that the rinse and repeat method of your life. Right? You remember like the 80s whenever you came out with shampoo and conditioner all in one? If you didn't get it right the first time, just rinse and repeat. <laughs> like, is it not a waste of money? It's like horrible commercials, but yet I remembered it today. Sometimes our brokenness is because of others. 2017, I was so broken by one person in my life. I let them steal so much joy from me. But forgiveness had to come for me to be healed and for them to get out of my life. But... <laughs> but not in a bad way. I had to learn that lesson. Not so I could put a hardened heart to any other obstacle I had or other people in my life, which I did for a little while. We had struggles, <laughs> you know, trust issues. But I've been so open and free to God what His will is that I understand now that I'm going to be hurt, but it's how I come out the other side of it how we can come out the other side of being hurt by others. And brokenness is also a sign of a testing. Did you know that you will be tested in your life? That God allows you to be tested? Remember, I, I went through that a couple you know, weeks ago. How far broken will God take you? My wife and I are still in that process yet I will worship. She will worship. There's days that we struggle, but we will still worship. Will you? So right now in our lives, we call these Job moments. How many of you know the story of Job? Okay, if you don't, you're going to find out today. <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm going to read chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, turn to them. If not, I will read very concisely, as slow as I can. But if you have a Bible, get it out. If you, no matter what kind you have, you know, the real Bible with papers, and you hear, shh, 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 shh. Or those fake ones, you yeah, know, that's fine too. You know, you want to go... You know, you can Google it you didn't download the Bible app on your smartphone. <laughs> Got a couple up here. Pastor Andy throws the Bibles at the kids. He really wants Jesus in their life, so he just beats them with Bibles. <laughs> but Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. So if you know anything about Job, oh, and Brad was so nice. Is this? Yes, ESV. Perfect. That's the one I'm going to read from. So he was also nice enough to throw it up on the screen for you. We got many modes of transportation here today, people. My mode of transportation is kind of failing me, though. <laughs> no, literally, my car is actually failing me right now. That's another thing. Just God's going to provide, man. He got me here. I <laughs> just hopefully get home. Somebody follow me? <laughs> Anybody going my Oh, you go my way. <laughs> you just follow me and push. All right. Job chapter 1, starting at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. Yeah, just say Uz. Oh, no, you got to say Uz. 
Because the story doesn't get, it's not us. This is not a happy-go-lucky story, people. It's us. It started out bad when you land, live in the land of us. Whose name was Job? I mean, Job. Job's is a different guy. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons. Go yeah, keep track, people. This is a numbers thing. Seven sons, three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. That's like really strange. And very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them, them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. What a good father, right? I'm going to sacrifice for my kids, even though they're a bunch of heathens like people from Catan. <laughs> it's nothing against you Catan people, it's just me and Andy. So <laughs> Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came along among them. Okay. So we're tracking a little different part of the story here, right? God's like, all right, what's up, guys? What are we doing today? You know, hanging out. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Like, don't you remember I kicked you out of here? I don't want to talk to you. You don't know me. Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Okay. So God just lobbed up this volleyball. Balls in the air. Let's see what happens. There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Uh, let's see here. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in, is in your hand. Oh, that ball's starting to come down. Let's see what happens. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. What happens next? Here we go. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed him. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He fell on the ground and worshipped when he lost nearly everything. Later in the story, and I'm not going to sit here and we're not going to read everything about how everything else starts going away, his health. 
But God lobbed the volleyball up in the air, came down, and Satan took a full advantage of spiking that ball against Job. Job put a hand on that ball. It went out of bounds because he was on the ground worshiping God. He fell flat on his face to worship God in the midst of this despair and everything else. So if you know the story, his wife was left behind. A couple of friends came by. Some wonderful people in his life, right? If you know the story. If you don't know the story, I suggest that you go home and read it today. Because I'm not going to read it all for you. But we'll get to the end in a minute. But I want to point that emphasis that Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. When we are facing our brokenness, what do you do? Sit there and cry and wallow in your self-pity. I have been there. I did it on my way home after working 12 hours yesterday. I pulled over. God, just get me home. Just get me home. He got me home. He got me home. But when we see our brokenness, what gets you to your brokenness? Has it been your own fault? Is there things in your life that you've put there that you won't get rid of, but yet you know it's harming you? You know it's making you sick. You know that you should be doing something else. Are there people in your lives that are hurting you, yet you still find an attraction to them? Not you know physically, but an attraction to a friendship that you thought you had or you think you have. But is there a time in which you are now being faced with brokenness so that God can make you better? He can reassemble you into His creation, His original purpose for you. 2017 was hard. 2018 has just been, what I would say, close to hell for us. But yet, I will worship Did I curse God yesterday? No, but I asked a whole lot of whys. I'm just going to say that. I did ask him why. Why is it now? Why can't we get through this? Keep saying I have a purpose. Stay true. That's the only thing I can hold to right now. In the midst of the pain that my wife goes through, the possible future surgeries, not fully getting refunction of her arm, losing complete feeling in her face on the right side. I pray that it's all temporary because my God can heal. Can yours? If you said amen, that means you can be healed today. Your brokenness can be healed today. You want to turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to be at verse 1. What's interesting, I told you about the one death this year for our family. It was my brother. If you'd been here, you know the story a little bit behind that. I had forgotten when I did the service for, his, for the family, I used Romans 5. And there's a good reason. Romans 5, chapter 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? <laughs> through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, 
And hope does not put us to shame, but God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, given, has been given to us. What hope do you have today? You have hope in God's word. And he will reassure you and reassemble you in your brokenness. Holidays are tough, are they not? The Atwood family, our prayers go out for them for the loss of their brother Mike. Uncle, father, son. Hit some people here. We share our love with them. If you have a lost loved one from over the years, holidays are always the toughest because those are the most memories you have usually. Don't let the past be breaking you today. The memories are supposed to be joyful, unless they were like really bad ones, and just crush those down. <laughs> Put them in a trash compactor, you know, whatever you got to do. But remember the good memories. Putting this together, I go back and through and go, what has been broken in my life in the deaths of family members? And a uh, cousin of mine posted a picture of us from circa 1983 to 1984, we were trying to narrow down the year. I was a good-looking kid. I could see nothing changed. <laughs> Except for the gray hair, maybe, and the beard. A few pounds. Okay, so now that I feel bad about myself, <laughs> I don't feel as bad as my one cousin who's completely bald now. He had, like, these cool, like, full mullet, yeah, from the 80s. Yeah, man. But look in the back and how many people are actually not in that photo anymore. Like, hey, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> half your family's dead. It wasn't half. It was four people in the picture out of about 20. That's still 25%. But you go through and just look at it and go, how many others have been born out of that family photo? There's about another 12 to 13. I can't remember all the little ones that run around and how many more they're popping out today. You know. But the loss is also reborn in the creation of others. How broken can you be when you hold a baby? That's why I love these children in our church. Not because I'm weird and creepy, but because they're such a pure joy. I have to wait for more grandchildren, so I live vicariously through other people's children sometimes. And I don't want grandchildren anytime soon. <clears throat> Not even paying attention. So I don't have to worry about that. As long as there's devices in their hands, I'm sure everything else will be safe. Get grief. They're still, whatever. Sometimes there's lost hope. Just drop more Bibles on them, please. <laughs> Just pull the shelf down, whatever you got to do. <laughs> Okay, yes, yes, that's what it is. It's, she's really focused on Romans right now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you talk about being broken. I'm the pastor. My own kids don't even pay attention. <laughs> I heard every word you said. I know they did. It's the only reason they have that in their hands. Sometimes that's the only way I can get them to listen. You just got to talk loud enough, that's all. Oh. See, my heart also hurts whenever they cry. But are you trying to put pieces of your life back together? Are you? Why? Why are you trying to do anything? You want it to be fixed? You want to go fix it yourself? Go right ahead. I got tools out in my car. I got a bunch of duct tape. They said duct tape fixes everything. I think that that's a lie. It comes close. It comes close, but not everything. What was if I gave you a, a, a glass window? What about that? Could you duct tape that together? You think you'll have all the pieces? Would it look the same? No. So why are you trying to fix your life on your own? You could try. You can make things change in your life. You can do something different. You can bring about a positive spin. You could try. But without God, is it worth it? 
Are you in the broken trap? You remember? Rinse, repeat. You really want to stay in that trap where you know something's hurting you. Someone's hurting you. Do you really want to stay in that trap? Where are you at today with all that? God doesn't want you to stay in the brokenness. He wants you to start being mended. He wants to whip out the super glue and start assembling the pieces back together. But in His way, not yours. So where are you at today? See, in Proverbs 17.22, you don't have to pull this one up. This is just a quick one. A joyful heart is good medicine. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Medicine go down. Medicine. Right? Joy. A joyful heart. Put it this way. I love you guys, but it was kind of sad in here this morning. It's just something felt down. You know, the 50 plus inches of rain we've had this year may not have helped. But some of you can go, thank God it's not 10 degrees colder. You woke up this morning, thank God I'm not dead. Got here either on your own accord or you know, through a Honda Accord, whatever. Yeah, that's the car of the disciples, recommended by 11 out of 12 of them. But Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine. But. Why does there always have to be a but? Why does there always have to be a but? But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. How many times have your spirit's been crushed? How many times have your bones been hurting? Maybe of a break of the past or just that down heaviness of your life. I know what it means to not get out of bed for days on end. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you've been walking through a fog? See, last Sunday I came up and Pastor Marissa came over and she said, what can I pray for you? The fog to be lifted? Oh my goodness, don't tell Pastor Marissa to pray for you to have the fog lifted. Oh my goodness, you can see clearly now. The rain is gone. <laughs> I'm like, whoo, I am a new man. Not because of her, but because of my God. Last Sunday got me through here to today. But I'm going to tell you now, if your spirit is crushed, your bones will hurt. Try to find joy so that you can take that medicine. Sometimes we think we need God less and ourselves more. Well, that's what happens when we try to fix things on our own, right? Whenever we try to put the pieces back together of our life, yet they still fall apart because we're using, you know, Dollar Tree glue instead of, you know, the Gorilla Glue, right? Why don't go for the best? Quit being so cheap. <clears throat> Why not get the best from God? Because He will provide the strength, the reassurance, the hope, the transformation that your life needs. I read this, and I loved it so much. It says, one day someone is going to hug you so tight. You ever had a nice, big, warm hug? So tight, it was like, oh, it hurts too much, but I don't want you to stop. You know, you ever had a hug like that? And you've never been hugged by me if you haven't. So... One day, someone is going to hug you so tight that all of your broken pieces will stick back together. Guess what? I don't know if you realize God's arms were always open wide to you. They were strung on a cross for you. 
They were ready and willing and able to put your pieces back together. Just fall into his arms and he will do that. Fall into his arms and he will do that. I told you we're going to get back to Job. We're going to go to the end of Job, chapter 42. Job chapter 42, verse 1, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. Come on, give me an amen. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, you know, one of Job's friends, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you. See, even through the brokenness, God's telling these knuckleheads, you know, the three stooges, who we call them, go to your brother Job, take some stuff to him. He's going to sacrifice them. He's going to pray for you. You need prayer more than he does, yet he just lost everything. But he still worships me. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you accordingly, according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Easy button. Just listen to Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friend, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Did Job care about the material? He cared about what? His God. You heard messages from last month, right? But if you give it to him, he will repay you. You can look at it right here. And then came to him all his brothers and sisters, all who had known him before, and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and can comfort him. Where were they at before? Where were they at the 40-some chapters before, you know, before these other three stooges showed up and his wife? Sorry, nothing against wives. It's just he didn't have the good, you know, equal yoked spouse, the good partner. But she said, curl up, you know, and curse God. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, and a partridge in a pear tree. And he also has seven sons and three daughters. How many kids did he have before? Seven and three. One son for each day of the week, you know, because that, guess what their names were? No, I don't know. It's not in here. <laughs> if you know, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but you, you knew where I was going. Anyhow, but he called the name of his first daughter, Jemiah. Jem, Jemima. I can never say it right. Jemmy. We'll just call her that. And the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuch. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. Oh, boy. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years. Saw his sons and his sons four generations. And Job died, (laughs) an old man, (laughs) hopefully after 140 years. And full of days. Lived life to the fullest, clear to the end. Lived life. Lost everything. 
did not curse God, he worshiped God. What are you going to do when you lose a little bit? The things that my wife and I have faced over this year? Perspective. She walked away from that accident where somebody, she should have been dead. No way you can meet your car in a cement truck and walk away. She has her life, most of her health, body hurts, but it's perspective. Her words to me was, I called out to God and said, I'm yours. She thought that truck was coming on top of her. He wasn't ready for her. He doesn't know how to handle her like I do. <laughs> Maybe that's what my purpose is to settle. Now, you know my wife. Yeah, really. She says all of like five words. But when she says something, you better listen. Right, kids? Yep. She does. I don't have the same thing over them. But listen. In the season of joyfulness, season of hope, Season of peace and love. Find your brokenness. Give it to God. Because what else can you do? You can sit and wall in your suffering and miss out on the joy of what the season's about, right? Or you can embrace the brokenness, face God and say, God, I've been doing this on my own. I'm tired of this. Lay a healing over me. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. You sometimes forget about that one. Because you let everything else fall first. Your spirituality will bring the joy and the hope and the peace that you need through the love of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, 14 says this, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Are you praising God in everything that you do? Are you praising God through every circumstance that he's bringing you through? If you think the circumstances he's left you and you are alone, it's because you've distanced yourself away from God. He wants to heal you. He wants you to sing praise through it all. Bow down and worship him. I will Worship him in my brokenness. He wants to put the pieces back together. He is the gorilla glue versus the Dollar Tree glue. He is the good duct tape, not that stuff that falls apart as soon as you open the package. He wants you, all of you, not as a collective, but every single piece that is broken inside of you. He wants each piece to be reassembled in his creation, which he created you. Where are we at in this brokenness today? Where are you at personally? You've seen where my family's been at, yet we will praise God. Is it a struggle some days? Yes, I'm not going to sit here and lie. But we will praise God. What will you do today? We can do this together, but only He can put you back together. What will you do today? Father God, in the midst of the season that is the birth of your son, Jesus. You were born to die, but in such a mighty way. We were born to die too, but in such a minuscule way. So God, we are broken people. I heard one of your brother, my brothers and sisters and you, Lord, Say it that we're all a bunch of cracked pots. Our pieces are kind of falling out, but we're still kind of holding together. But whatever you're pouring into my brokenness may be poured out onto somebody else's. Whatever leaks out the cracks that you have in my brokenness may be poured out for somebody else's blessing. Lord, use us today. Use us to be voices in other people's lives. Let our voice be your voice. But let us turn to you for the broken pieces to be reassembled, God. To reassemble into the creation you want us to be. Reassembled into the purpose you have us set for. God, today, hear us. Because I know there's people in this room today that are broken. Masking it with a smile. And there's people here today 
that are hurting, not just themselves, but they're hurting others. Lord, fix our brokenness. Let us turn to you today. Let us reach for you today. Let your presence be made known into our lives. Father, we love you. We just call upon the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We pray this all through that wonderful name. Amen. So today in your brokenness, be a cracked pot. Give somebody a warm hug. Don't hug them too tight. You don't want to break any bones. I'm going to say, oh, Pastor Mark said you can break somebody. <laughs> Let's not break anybody. But before you go today, as Pastor Andy loves to say, love on someone. Don't leave here today not feeling loved. And if you don't feel loved, come see me. I will make sure you're loved. <laughs> I will be the ultimate hugger. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day.